Welcome, one and all, to Shortcast, the Brandon Sanderson podcast. We are a bunch, although today it's a reduced bunch, of mega fans giving you news, theories, discussions, funds, games, a custom emoji, and other things from the, the Sanderverse. And uh, uh, also we give you this podcast in which we're going to be talking about things. But before we talk about things, who's our cast? Grace, who are you? Hello, I am Gator Girl. Welcome, Gator Girl. Rasar, who are you? Rasar, yes, hi. I'm, I'm Ala, but you might more know me, know me better as Rasar. I know how intros are done, and I am Argent, who sometimes is known as Evgeny on legal documents. But if people come knocking on your door asking about me, my name is George. With that out of the way, today uh, we will talk about the thing. That is on my background if you are benefiting from the video feed. But if you're not benefiting from the video feed or if you have no idea what's going on here, I say as I, as I point to Kaladin's butt, we, we will talk about some, uh, some preview chapters from Stormlight 5. At, 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 at this moment, as of the moment of this recording, we have a few, uh, nothing like super, super new, although we do have one moderately recent. Uh, we have a few chapters that Brandon has read over the past year or so. And even though we did do a dedicated episode on the Stormlight 5 prologue uh, when that came out, link will probably be in the doobly-doo. We haven't really done an episode on the chapters since then. And we do have a couple of Kaladin chapters. We do have three Zeth flashback chapters or sequences. And we have one kind of interesting Yasna chapter that we're gonna we're gonna talk about. So I am celebrating this. Oh, that's unfortunate. Uh, so viewers, my drink is not actually transparent. <laughs> uh, my drink is actually green. <laughs> but my my green screen <laughs> caught it. I was I I'm drinking a grasshopper, uh, a cocktail which looks gorgeous, by the way. And I'm I'm sad that you can't benefit from that. I know. I think you just wrapped your drink in a green screen just to trick us. <laughs> I think this is all an elaborate thing. I, I do I do love how how it, it looks almost bubbly and fizzy because of the the green screen. So that is that is what we are doing today. Uh, and I think I think we're going to do this kind of by um, by character, right? So instead of going in chronological order in the way that Brandon read these, uh, we'll just take either the Kaladin sequence, the Zeth sequence, or the one Yasna chapter, uh, and then we'll talk about what's happening there and where we think where we think things are headed. So what are we what are we feeling like, gang? Where where do we want to start? We could like start from Kaladin since that was the first chapter that got released. Sure. All right. Let's talk about Kaladin. So does either one of you want to give me just like a, a one minute recap of what happens in those first two Kaladin chapters? Sure. So we start with Kaladin being actually feeling pretty well for once. Like... <laughs> Yeah, he is actually feeling pretty better, pretty much better than he did before, though still not great. And he and still do talk about how he's feeling better and how Syl has started to appear more adult recently. She's been wearing like an adult hava and walking in full sized body and then they go to visit Cardin's brother, brother Oroden who is playing with blocks and they take advantage of the fact that the tower now powers the entire surge binding indefinitely within it to have some fun with anti-gravity building blocks <laughs> and with floating around. And it's just generally a nice family moment. Lirin comes in and he and Calden discuss how Dalinar's hospitals suck. And then uh, Kaladin tells them that he has to set out because he promised Dalinar that he'll take Zev to 
go and hunt down Ishar and hopefully talk him down from trying to do, you know, murder in general. So Kaladin then goes with Syl to visit Dalinar to have the last one last chat with him before departing. But on the way, he stumbles into Wit, who is, you know, doing Wit things, talking about random stuff, including going on a very long screed against the passions of Phylon. And then it turns out that he was, he was pretending like, oh, Dalinar is busy. I'm going to take up your time because, you know, Dalinar still has a meeting. And eventually when the two of them say they, their goodbyes, it turns out that Dalinar was the one waiting for Wit to stop talking. And that's, that's where we end the Kaladin chapters. Great. Thoughts? How are we, how are we feeling about this? What are we, let's talk about, not necessarily in this order, but just as points that we can talk about. Uh, we can talk about where Kaladin is in kind of uh, mentally and emotionally and character wise. And we can also talk about any interesting new reveals or discoveries that these chapters offer to us. Well, I think to start off, the most important detail from this chapter is that when the Kaladin first meets Wit, he's actually reading An Accountability of Virtue, which yeah. is a romance <laughs> novel from the Alista interlude. <laughs> Uh, so I, I have a I have a question for you, Greg. Was it yes. was it that he was reading Accountability of Virtue or was he reading the sequel? No, I think he was he was reading an Accountability of Virtue because uh, it was Wemma was the main character and the sequel is about her sister. Because the comment he makes is like, oh, like Wemma finally realizes that Vadam is like the right choice. Now let's see how like they mess it up or something like that. Yeah. Okay, okay. In in my head, it was a hundred percent the sequel, but that both of these options are 100% winners. I, ho I hope we'll be getting more like accountability of virtue lore in future books. <laughs> which is, which is, yes, some, some people, some people want the in-world way of kings or words of radiance. No, we, we want the in-world accountability of virtue because that's, that's the true content that we're here <laughs> for. I'll, I'll say that like, the opening line of, of the first chapter and what is, I presume, going to be the first chapter of the book, because it's the first one that Brandon read, is just a banger, right? It's just, I, I, and I don't have the chapter pulled up, but I think it was just like, Kaladin was feeling happy. Which is, which is such a simple line, but it's like... It's Kaladin felt good. Oh, Kaladin felt good. It's such a simple line, but it, it comes with like, such a large amount of it's not baggage but like background where if you are if you are going into this book with like knowing everything that happened before and everything Kaladin has been through in the previous books that line has meaning right mm -hmm. it carries a weight and I think that's I think it's a great opener yeah Love that. yeah we need we need somewhere to start to tear him down again for the rest of the robot <laughs> oh Christ <laughs> You're Ooh. bad. Why are you bad? I, I also do like how, like, Hoyt ju Wit just calls out that Kaladin is inventing therapy, and Kaladin is like, What's therapy? <laughs> what therapy? <laughs> You'll be the first, Roshar's first therapist. The first what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. I'll say that felt a little on the nose. Yeah. For me. Because obviously, like, within the fandom, we've joked a lot about, oh, Kaladin is inventing therapy, right? And there's no reason that Wit wouldn't know that word. Like, he's, he's very well-traveled. There are probably worlds out there. I mean, Skadriel probably has therapists at this point. Mm. So, like, there's no reason for him to not know that, but... The, the call out in world felt a little, a little on the nose to me. But fortunately, uh, it sounds like Wit thinks that both of them are going to die. So <laughs> we, we won't have any of these weird call outs anymore. I, I think there's that line in there when, when Kaladin's like, or when, when Wit says something of like, it seems like one of us could die. And then Kaladin's like, but aren't you immortal or something like that? And internally, I'm just like, yes, Wit is immortal. You are not. Well, he he does he does follow up and say though oh immortality doesn't go yeah that doesn't go quite as far as it used to these days, which is an interesting thing that maybe we can talk about for a minute. Like, 
is this is is he talking about okay are there has the power level of the Cosmere increased since its early days to the point where immortality like there are more things now that can kill immortals such as night blood maybe some other things like that um, navani basically invented anti-investiture last last book so i assume that's what he was talking about the fact that navan raboniel has used navani's research to perma kill spren Mm. And like this research is out because Raboniel has sent all the information about it to Colinar before she died. That's true. But in in some ways Hoyt is spren like, I say with authority without knowing <laughs> <laughs> what I actually mean by that. I guess <laughs> I guess in my head I, I fell into the Sharon trap of like immortals or spren. Um, uh, but no, like the, the whole thing with like his his body regenerating, like there is like there, there are he's not spren. He, he's he's immortal though. Is is what what's going on? Uh, but like, how? What are you? What? How? What is anti investiture going to do to him? Right? You can't well, you can't pump him. Like you can hit him with anti stormlight, but that doesn't necessarily do anything for him or anti void light, but that doesn't necessarily do anything for him. Like he's not made of a specific kind of investiture, right? I mean, I don't think it would be good. What you, th- you think he's going to like absor- absorb in like, I, what do you, what do you, that, 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 that almost made it seem like you think it would be good. No, 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 not not that it would be good, but like he's saying, hey, immortality is not what it used to be. And and so I'm saying I don't think anti-investiture is, as far as he is concerned, something that he's particularly worried about in this context. I mean, he is full of breath, so I'm not sure if breath would somehow interact with anti-stormlight if he were to somehow get it into his system. Mm. I mean, I wonder, so... Does the, this conversation happen in the second Kaladin chapter or the first? Uh, the second one. I wonder if there's something where it's like, we get the Yasna chapter in between them, but like chronologically it happens before this. Oh, so you think the Yasna chapter might be like contextualizing? Mm-hmm, maybe, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the timeline of how, when these things happen exactly. It could like even even if it's not anti-investiture, he could still be talking about those like Razium knives that Moash used to kill Yezrian. Mm. I mean, could just be like that asshole Kelsier somehow got got immortality. It can't be that great, you know. <laughs> I thought it was, but right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he managed to do it. I no, I I I, I think it's just hey, there are. Things are more dangerous now than, than they used to be, right? And and anti-investiture would be one of these things. And, and things yeah. like night blood, yeah. night blood would be another. Let's let's hop back to the first chapter real quick, uh, where we have just a sequence of adorable scenes between Kaladin and Hesina and uh little baby Orden, uh and and even Lyran to an extent, right? They have Kaladin and Lyran are are now in a place where they they've reconciled their differences a little bit, mm-hmm. but it's been a day, right? Yeah. And so <laughs> they're they're like super awkward and, and they don't know what to do with each other. Whereas the relationship between Kaladin and Hesina is much more naturally like, oh yeah, they clearly love each other and care about each other. Yeah. That. But amidst all of that, right, we have the, the casual lore drop that lashings don't seem to run out. Now that the tower is active. Yeah, it seems like just every Radiant is just perma powered up at this point, as long as they are in the tower. Like, I'm pretty sure Kaladin spends most of those first two chapters just floating from yeah. place to place because he can. Yeah, I mean, it also seems like like Navani has like a weird, like, like when, isn't it like when Cell like senses Navani near? She's like, oh, Navani, gotta go. Yeah, 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 and and Kaladin thinks that like a lot of the Spren do the same thing, right? Yeah, which is 
I know. I know. Before Rhythm of War, we we had theories that there would be a, a, a essentially a spren of spren out there. We thought it would be Baro Mishram, which is still possible, I guess. But the sibling fulfills that role a little bit in this, uh, whether it's just thematic or there's something else going on. But like back in in Rhythm of War, when we first met them. They were very concerned with like the well-being of Spren and like like mm-hmm. they were <laughs> sending right. Navani these these anonymous threat notes. They're like, hey, mm-hmm. stop your Fabrio research and all of that. And obviously that yeah. continued like throughout the book. And so this this reminds me of that, right? Yeah. Spren being fascinated by yes, Navani, but I I like. They were not fascinated with Navani before she became mm-hmm. the sibling's bondsmith, right? So there, there's something going on there. I, I think there's a couple of things that this sort of reminds me of. First, I, I think, you know, it makes sense that the sibling would maybe not want to bond with someone like Navani, where it's like, hey, I'm giving you free access to all the sprint you could potentially want to experiment with if I form this bond with you. Yeah. Like, I, I feel mm-hmm. like that. Sort of in hindsight, I understand why if the sibling does not like Fabrioles bonding with someone who is very interested in them and likes experimenting on Spren would be a very dangerous thing for the sibling in particular. Yeah, I admit I, I still have my misgivings about sibling bonding Navani and how that happened. So, oh, uh, you were yeah. you were hashtag Team Relaine. I I was, and also like. I it's not worth getting into like in episode on uh, book five readings, but I, I was not happy with how the actual bonding moment went went mm. down and what caused the sibling to actually not even like make the choice, but like be put in a situation where they have to bond Navani. Yeah, that's that's fair. I'm sure we'll, we'll find a place to talk about that at, at some point. And, and my, my other thought sort of relating to this was I wonder if Navani being bonded to the sibling is going to finally get us some like ancient fabriol, how they are made uh, sort of lore, because I feel like now if anyone has the ability to make sort of like that oh. ancient soul caster type fabrioles, I feel like it would be Navani bonded to the sibling. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I do, I do wonder about like the interest of Spren in, in this bond. That is that is interesting to me, because uh, because Sil is almost like not actually compelled, but it's not some kind of a passing interest. It's it's something new and unique and exciting and very universal for the sprint. And I don't I don't know what to make of that, because mm-hmm. they are, for example, not interested in Dalinar and the Stormfather in in that way. I do feel like I have too little information to speculate on the on this at this point but because like maybe maybe it's as simple as like the sibling is constantly pumping out power light because dalinar dalinar isn't mm-hmm. always creating stormlight he has to like cool. actually focus to do it and stormfather only comes to visit once a week while the the sibling is like always there and always creating tower light mm. yeah that's they are that's true I want to talk about Syl for a moment. Actually. Let's talk about Syl for a moment. Yeah, because it's interesting that apparently, like, since Kaladin has sworn the fourth oath, she's been more human shaped, if that makes sense. Like, she she's walking around in uh, human proportions, even if she like makes herself shorter than Kaladin for whatever reason. Uh, she's also wearing like adult Vorin clothes as opposed to the skirts she used to yeah. and she like actively swaps into the uniform when they go to see Dalinar so and, and she has done some of this before right mm-hmm. none of this is is new necessarily but it is interesting and, and she says that she feels like people are treating her more as a person when she is appearing more like a person so mm-hmm. i didn't think much of this outside of like an internal decision on her part going hey yeah that's 
people are being weird when I am a tiny little sprite. Let me let me go walk around as a as a real person, except when I want to be whimsical ancient princess and make fun of people. I guess it's like it just caught my eye because it, this happens like a day after he's sworn the fourth oath and like the the narration calls out that this is happening. That's true. I don't know if I am like, do you think she now has the power to do that? Because she does say it's a little bit more difficult for her to do that. Or do you think that... So when the Radiants speak an oath, they like the oath represents like an insight into who they are kind of a self-reflection thing do you think that sill also had a similar moment whether it's magical or just like a switch in the brain that's like oh that's actually what i want i think like the the because the oath like bring the spren and the person together yes and the last notable moment when we saw Sil like full sized and narration like pointed that out was when he was a uh, Kaladin was swearing his second oath in yes yeah, second oath in the way of kings right when she like tells him that she's a, she's an honor spren uh yeah a little before so I wonder if this is like she because they are like closer together like spiritually she appears more human. Or like more like her shades more self because like she is human size in shades more. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also this is going to sound slightly silly, but also the the fact that she is like now being shown as preferring the human form and dressing more like an adult woman. You know, there is a popular ship nope. in the fandom. No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> uh, is it the Wonder Sail? No, not that ship. <laughs> See, I so my my thinking on this is like when when we first see Spren sort of get pulled into the physical realm in the beginning of a bond, they're very like childlike almost. Like, and I wonder if this is sort of her her almost like becoming sort of the person that she always was. Like, yes, she's like whimsical and like poking fun at people, but I I do think like. When we look at her actions of like running away to like bond the cow, like there's this deep sense of like responsibility and this deep sense of like like wanting to be sort of taken seriously, like when looking at like her relationship with the other honor spren and the storm father. And I wonder if sort of what we see is sort of maybe now that she has this bond and now that more of her like mind is anchored in the physical realm, that side of her coming through. Oh, yeah, I I can imagine that being true. Yeah, we do also know and we didn't mention spoiler policy at the beginning of the episode, full Cosmere spoilers, everything. Also, because we are recording this somewhat close to the release of Secret Project 4, no spoilers for Secret Project 4 that is not out yet. But uh, in in Trust of the Emerald Sea, when we learn about Luhel bonds, I think either either Hoyd or Ulam, but I think it was Hoyd as the narrator, tells us that some bonds trade consciousness for, mm-hmm. and he's obviously talking about the Nahel bond, right? Uh, for power. And so like for a long time, we've known that when Spren, like the, the more a Spren gets pulled into the physical realm, the more of its own mind or their own mind they get. And so that that could certainly be a factor, right? We have... A, a very hard mechanical reason for oh, Calden and Sil are now level four. Sil has been pulled even further, or has even greater access into like the benefits of the sp- of the physical realm, and just like has access to more of her own mind. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so tell us about this famous ship you wanted to tell us about. <laughs> That's that's not that's not the wonder sale apparently. Well, there are of course people who ship Kaladin with Sil because Kaladin is shipped with every single character in the Stormlight Archive. That is true. That is true. Kaladin yeah. Dalinar, mm. El yeah, Ka- Primo. Kaladin, Ka- especially because like Kaladin doesn't really have a lot of interest in the book. 
a current one, mm-hmm. which is rather unusual for a fantasy protagonist, to be honest. <laughs> so yeah, so there is a lot of people who think that Syl is the romantic endgame for Kaladin. So when I was like, Kaladin is noticing that Syl is acting more adult and she's wearing a formal hat and being human sized, there was a part of me was wondering if Brandon is like making gestures towards that ship. Setting it up. Yeah. I don't like what you're saying. Mm-hmm. It's not my favorite ship, but it is a ship. So I, I, I will I will address the ship. Like I'm not addressing you necessarily. I'm just talking about the conversation. I think I, I've thought about why why Siladin bothers me. Um and I think it is because of the way their relationship is written. From Syl, I could maybe see a little bit of like teasing, playfulness, kind of exploring the idea of a relationship. Although even even calling it that seems extreme to me. Uh, but like at least she's she's playful about it. She's like acting. She's taking actions towards like being part of this relationship, whatever that relationship looks like, right? Mm-hmm. Kaladin is very passive in all of this, right? He is there being grumpy and broody. And yes, he will sometimes act off of what Sil is doing, but Sil is the initiator in all of this. And and like Kaladin almost never probably until like this chapter is is like being introspective of like of of like he he doesn't really think of her unless she does something is is what i feel like right uh and and he certainly doesn't think romantic things or <laughs> stormfather forbid forbid sexual things <laughs> I mean, like it is. It is a valid ship. Like it's not one I like, but the the fact to go bad for the Saladin shippers for a moment, she still is like the the female character that Carden has the deepest relationship with. That isn't his mother. <laughs> and they are literally soulmates. Yeah, and I mean they they are going to hunt down Ishar, and we know he's experimenting with the uh, oh, no. spread into the physical realm. <laughs> Grace, you made it worse. I know, that was the goal. You <laughs> always make these things worse. <laughs> yeah, that's possible, I guess. I hate it. I mean, like, we have how many pages left? Like, maybe the arc in this book is like, Paladin slowly, you know, starts to recognize Syl as more of like a woman figure, and then they make it to Ishar, and Ishar captures Syl, pulls her into the physical realm, and, you know, maybe maybe because of their, like, she's already bonded, she's able to survive in the physical realm when the other sprint haven't, but she's, like, devastated and horrified, and Kaladin has to, like, use his new therapy powers to comfort her, and that <laughs> develops into a romantic relationship. The good old therapy binding. To be honest, like, as far as surviving in physical realm goes, Still being human shaped has a way better start than like cryptics. Yeah, but like all, all of the other other spren just right, died, right. right? Yes, they were they were they are shape, but but they just died. But yeah, she's bonded. You I really hate how you like show up on the show and have like theories that I hate, but they <laughs> they they make sense. They just make sense. My favorite thing is taking something that is absolutely cursed and making it plausible. <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, that is, I can, yes, I can vouch that this is, in fact, your favorite thing. Uh, let me drink from my grasshopper. <laughs> it's literally like showing grass fruit. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Looks like sparkling water. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to other things. I don't think there's much in like Kaladin's first chapter that we, we need to address, right? This is just yeah. kind of a cutesy family chapter. There is a thing in 
the second chapter, which is the the wit mm-hmm. talk that I found interesting. Uh, so first of all, we have like a, a small, quick confirmation of something that we've speculated for a long time, which is that the passions are related to odium. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not shocking, but with just going and say, hey, the passions are derived from the teachings of odium. That makes sense. You're saying a religion title to the passions are based <laughs> off cultivation or honor? Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow, um, what a shocker. Shocker. It, I am I am like a little curious about how like that developed from a historical standpoint, right? Uh, but presumably like the humans came from Ashen. Uh, they brought the teachings of Odium with them, who was their mm-hmm. god. Uh, and presumably those like teachings evolved into the passions at some point, I think. Not, not terribly interesting. What is a little more interesting to me is uh, when uh, uh, Wit gives Kaladin a new flute, it teaches him how to play like a basic melody. And then either before or after that, just like immediately, uh, he says something that's, that's interesting to me, uh, yeah. which is you are going to have to learn to play music, Aladdin, without using your breath or your lips. And, and then there's a, there's a callback to this line later on when Kaladin's like, you were, oh, I... I have to, you, you say that I have to learn to play music with like, without using my, my breath and I have to learn how to fight without fighting. That's, I don't know. Like Wit says a lot of things that, mm-hmm. that don't make sense to the characters, but often make sense to us. This doesn't make sense to me either. I am, I am as confused as Karadin here. So I... And so I, I've had this theory for a long time that like these books are kind of leading towards our main characters being able to like hear the rhythms. Okay. And so I, I personally think that that is what that is referring to. Like he is going to like have to sort of tap into the rhythms of Roshar. I know a lot of people think this sort of, sort of like a, you're going to have to swear the fifth ideal and become like a leader and have people fight for you and not be the one to fight yourself type thing. Yeah, the the fighting thing I can see, right? Or or it's kind of a, you know, not not a fight with the spear, but it's a fight of of like the the mind or ideologies or something like yeah. that. Yeah. But the music thing was weird. Yeah. Yeah, my my brain just immediately went to like Stormlight Archive turning into a musical in the last part, but uh, pretty sure that's not what what Wit's driving just, at. Just just a flute solo. <laughs> yeah. It's just like music and like the rhythms are so integral to like the world of Roshar that it's hard for me to accept this as like a metaphorical thing that he's saying. Yeah, you, you're probably mm. right. Interesting. Because like there, there have been times when like Paladin is like, I think he's like in Shades of Our looking at the beads and he's like, it almost seems like there's a rhythm to it. And like there's instances when, when Relaine is like, Oh, like sometimes people will talk and it's like their voices will almost slip into one of the rhythms for a moment and it's but it's not quite there yet. Yeah. So Eshon I know it's the same thing with Gavala, yeah. right? Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. That is interesting. I don't know if I don't feel that here in this chapter, but it's 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 suspicious that the rhythms are, are coming up in, in like human context, right? Especially after the last book where we mm-hmm. learned, or at least Navani told us that humans are as much of Roshar as the singers because of how long it's been. So there yeah. might be something there. That's interesting. Yeah. Like speaking to rhythms is still like singing with breath and lips. Yeah, but he's talking about, he, he says playing music specifically, right? Oh, fair enough. Yeah, and, and like, but but the the singers are able to connect to a specific rhythm that's just always right. going without necessarily like singing or speaking anything. Yeah. which is sort of right. what I think. Like, because anyone can like, we see it with Navani. Anyone can learn a rhythm and like consciously mimic it. I think it's more like tapping into like that sort of innate connection to Roshar and being able right. to like feel the rhythm without having been taught that is what's going to happen 
that's what right. this is referring to. Yeah. I'm also reminded of like uh, the the word of Brandon we got during the interview where Brandon talked about how the heralds vary in power based on how like in line with Roshar's own investiture they are. Mm -hmm. So that that might find a way to tie itself into the rhythms as well <laughs> in some capacity. I, I wonder I wonder if we'll see the comeback of the that old theory that the main characters are going to replace heralds. Oh, they're going to become the heralds. Yeah. I don't. The prologue does kind of set up, set that up, but also like it's Gavilar and Galvilar is, is full of cram. Gavilar is full of crap. The storm father is being weird. Like the prologue is just, mm -hmm. I don't trust anything in the prologue. <laughs> And, and I just don't know how that would happen at this point with the duel and the contract. Like, I don't necessarily see a path towards that being the end of this sort of book. Personally, that's fair. I, I, I want to say that I find this unlikely, and I think I do. But I do have to acknowledge that the last book kind of made a point to kind of inform Dalinar that apparently restoring the Oath Pact is a possibility. And I, that's always been there in the back of my head. It does, it does feel like a sort of way to end like the midpoint of the series, like slap a bandage on this whole like Oath yeah. Pact situation until in the back half we figure out something more permanent. And it would also like... It would take our five main characters of this front half out of the action, which would let the other five who have been more in the background of the plot step into the limelight, as it were. Yeah, it will do that. I just... I don't know. I, I don't... Like... I mean, would it be like with Dalinar being you know, Honor's champion and taking up this duel, like, would Navani be the one to take up sort of that position in the Oath Pack? I don't know. I just, I just don't think... I think things would have to change pretty drastically between, like, where we are at the start of the 10 days and where we are at the yeah. end of the book for that to happen. Yeah. We, also, we also know that the Everstorm just changes things. Like, mm -hmm. Odium's like, I can't withdraw, I can't, like, take the fused with me back to Braze, one, because I can't force them to do things, but two, because the Everstorm means they don't actually go back to Braze. So like right. I don't I don't know if you can have a restored oath pact in the shape that it was before. Obviously mm -hmm. you can like forge a new oath pact, which is just like some kind of magical agreement to do things, right? But it might need to be something different. Right, that's a good point too. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what to make of it, to be honest. Yeah. So many questions, so few answers. <laughs> Any more questions we can squeeze out of these two <laughs> chapters? Not, not necessarily a question, but I do think... I, I kind of hope, and I, I don't know exactly how much of this there will be, but like... I think it would be interesting to see, like, if Liren becomes a character in Dalinar's sort of point of views and his arc while no. Kaladin is away and sort of that we'll see sort of that relationship develop and how they work together. I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of like hope that sort of happens where, like, you know, Dalinar and Liren still in Erythru working together while mm -hmm. Kaladin's away. Dalinar could definitely use, like, a character who's negative towards him without being like his son. <laughs> I'm thinking of Adolin here. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to say well, without being someone who's trying to kill him. <laughs> I mean, that, that as well, yes. <laughs> Generally, Dalinar could use someone who's like providing the opposite viewpoint. And the two of them are already on first name basis, apparently. <laughs> yeah. I, I found that. I found that hilarious. Yeah. I also just think that, like, Liren is, is, like, someone who Dalinar, like, would respect, I think. Like, just knowing Dalinar and knowing who Liren is, I think once they, like, spend any amount of time together, 
Liren's the type of person who, like, in in a past life, Dalinar would be, you're my medic now, come with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were, we, were we in Dalinar's POV when he met Liren on the board of the fourth bridge? I'm not sure, to be honest. I could not tell you. Because I know, I know they met, and and whoever's POV we were in was like, oh yeah, okay, this person looks nothing like Kaladin, but I get where Kaladin gets all of his traits from. I think it might have been Navani, but I'm not really sure. It was it was one of those two. I just don't remember which one it was. But yeah, I I would love like a a small like buddy comedy of like with with Kaladin's two dads yeah it's it's uh it's Navani okay all right yeah and also I feel like I feel like Liren could potentially be like a good mentor for Renarin if uh you Ooh. know you learning to use some of his healing powers and more of a <sighs> get some more of that surgical background I don't know I just feel like there is some potential there with Liren meeting the Colins sort of staying in a rithru while Kaladin's away. I would certainly love to see Liren interact with more of the characters that we have like experienced through Kaladin's eyes. Mm-hmm. Hey, maybe maybe the like through line for interludes is gonna be Liren this time around. Just every oh. every interlude is just him complaining about another Colin family member. Well, that there are enough Colins to do that, yeah. Each 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 uh each uh, part ends with someone getting horribly injured and each <laughs> each uh interlude it's just Lyran being like, All right, gotta sew up this co- a new one of the Colins. <laughs> gotta stop them from dying. The best mini novella. Grace Anatomy Urifiro Edition. All right. Unless we have anything else kind of last minute about these two chapters, uh, I think we've kind of covered pretty much everything, including some some speculation. So I would like us to to go and talk about Zeth a little bit. So Zeth, uh, we do get three of his flashback chapters and not a lot happens in those. It's It's certainly not like Shalan, where her first flashback is the I, I think it's the aftermath of like her mother's death. And it's like, oh my god, what is happening here? It's it's a lot, it's a lot closer to Kaladin, where it's just kind of a slice of life type of thing. Uh at a key moment. Uh and and we see uh Zeth. I don't remember if we are given an age, but in my head he's about 10. Uh, I think he's like 11. He did, it says 11. And I was going to say, I think it might even be a similar age to Kaladin, which is an interesting parallel. Sure. Okay. But he, he's a young boy and he is uh, uh, dancing to the, to the music of the wind and to the music of his sister, Illid, uh, who is older than him. And uh, we just kind of get a, a slice into Shinovar culture and how they have sheep because uh, they're shepherds. Uh, and we learn about the best character in the Stormlight Archive, which is Molly, the blind sheep, uh, <laughs> who is just the best. I thought you were going to say Dolk, Sun Dolk. We're apparently both idiots. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I, both Dolks I re- are idiots. <laughs> I refuse to believe that this is the final name. This is just... I really it, hope it is. It probably is. But anyway, he's, he's like dancing because uh, it's, it's a thing that he's good at. Uh, and he likes like improving himself. Uh, I think we we find a lot of, I guess this is veering off of a recap, but like I think we see a lot of like adult Zeth in this eleven year old child in many ways. But they're passing the time, um, and they find a stone, and stones are rare and holy in uh, in Shinovar, and so they're like, uh, well, we can't touch that. Uh, let's call mom and dad, see what they think. And they're like, well, uh, we don't want the stone here because the Shin leadership might kick us out because they might say the land is too holy. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're just going to we're going to move the stone somewhere else. Uh, And the decision is left to Zeth 
who ultimately decides to uh, to go with this plan. And as he's kind of struggling with his inner demons of, of having potentially disobeyed a rule, dear old future Skybreaker, they hear horns signaling or denoting that raiders from Stonewalker raiders have come to raid their lands like they sometimes do. Uh, and so they gather their sheep and they, they go and like hide kind of in the mountains in a ravine somewhere with like all of the other shepherds from the region. And we get a little bit more exposition into Shin culture while Zeth cooks. And uh, and he gets like very upset that the cook is like, no, oh, he's, yeah. he's like, I used the exact amount you told me to. How is it not perfect? Yep. <laughs> yep. And then and then the um, the farmers like all oh, this has too much pepper. <laughs> you can't you can't win that one, Zeth. You just can't win that one. But the the chapter ends with him and his sister realizing that a few of their sheep are missing, and a lot of those sheep is the best character in the Stormlight Archive, Molly, the blind ship. And he's like, I need to go and find her. And so he goes back to kind of uh, their homestead, which is closer away from the hiding space and closer to where the raiders are. And that's that's what happens with Zeth. Any thoughts? I think the series of chapters is going to end. This like series of events is going to end with Zeth killing someone. Mm. I, I think that's that's how he's going to get started on like training with the shard blade. He's going to kill one of the raiders like in self defense because like he went too close to the raiders and that's why he gets like taken away to become a shard bearer. Well, I, old blade bearer. I think they say in like Rhythm of War that his whole family is is like right isn't given to yeah. the honor blades mm-hmm. right. Yeah, so I, I could see that happening like at the end of this series. And we also like when when he runs into Ishar in the last book, uh, Zeth says something to the effect of, "Oh my, my father would never give this blade back to you." Uh, I, I don't know if, whether he says that or he thinks that, but the implication for me has been that Naturo has been the keeper, the the, ser- the servant of mm-hmm. is what they say of Ishar's blade. That's just like interesting because like the, the thing we learn in those first two chapters is that Zev is like the most pious member of his family. Yeah. I I thought it was interesting because when when his mother is like, it doesn't count as touching if I'm wearing gloves. And that kind of reminded me of like the way, you know, lower class Warren woman in like a letter like if I'm wearing a glove, my hand is still covered, but I can yeah. do everything with it that I can do with my let men can do. Yeah. So the, these raiders are like very interesting to me because like looking looking at the map of Roshar, there are basically like three countries that they could be coming from. If you're curious, they're Alm, Liafor, and Steen, which are countries that have like zero plot relevance. Liafor is where all the like fashion folios come from. Steen exists and Alm is actually where Nikli from Edge Dancer claims yeah. he is not not from Edge Dancer, from Wonder Sail, the Don't other shoot. famous ship. Don't shout. Uh, where Nikli uh, claims he is from. Yeah. And they need some kind of like harbor or shelter in direct high storms. Uh I mean if they're from nearby, it's probably, yeah. you know. They can just wait for high storm to pass, and then also like this far in the west, yeah. high storms are you know normal mm-hmm. storms essentially, mm-hmm. uh, so they're not as much of a danger. Yeah. yeah plus, there is like because like Shinovar is between two mountain ranges, so there is the other range to protect them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like they they like Stonewalkers pretty much have to approach from the sea, I think. Because mm-hmm, uh, like yeah. trying to invade through the mountains is probably just suicide. Yeah. Not to mention probably impossible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are like passes and stuff, right? But that that's that's a death trap. Right. Uh, now that now that Kaladin has a flute, do you think 
we'll see uh Kaladin playing the flute and Seth dancing along uh, on their right? journey. <laughs> I, I thought about this parallel. I think it feels intentional. <sighs> well, so so first of all, Kaladin is going to be complete garbage at the flute, yeah. right? Uh, but I but I did wonder if there's going to be a scene where like Kaladin is practicing and and we are in Zeth's POV and he's reminded of his sister and like that Ooh. that causes him to like open up a little bit to to Kaladin. Ooh, maybe maybe this is what prompts the first flashback scene. Maybe Kaladin oh. practicing his flute is like Zef hears it and he's reminded of Elid playing hers. Oh, because it, it kind of has this like movie. Oh, like the, the screen gets blurry and shifts and we transition into a memory. Yeah. And the music gets better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, that's that's cool. I, I did note that in the like little paragraph Brandon had before the he started reading, he was like, yeah, like I made these ones calm to like counteract everything else that's going on in this book at this time. Yeah, even even with the Raiders attack, like these Zeth flashbacks are just kind of chill. Slice yeah. of life. Yeah, oh. Zeth is the most unchill thing about those flashbacks. That is that is true. That is true. And I and I I alluded to this earlier, but I love how much of like modern day Zeth you can see in in the child that we see here. Mm-hmm. Like he is very concerned with like what is right? Uh, how do you know that things are right with like following the rules and kind of as a consequence of that, a natural aversion of uh, like avoiding or, or skirting or interpreting the rules in a different way. So yeah, he was, he was always going to be a skybreaker kid. In fact, in fact, it makes me wonder. So we know that and I don't remember where we learned that, but but we know that like Zeth used to hear a voice. I, I think it's when he gets Nightblood, uh, or in one of his interactions with Nightblood, he's like, like there was a there was a voice like yours back mm-hmm. in my childhood, right? Uh, which I've always assumed means that he bonded a Spren, uh, or a Spren was like at least interested in like following him around and bonding with him and and he looks like a lot of, lot like a skybreaker here i do wonder if it was like some some high spren even back then you know yeah. my my issue my only issue of that because like that would be cool but my one issue of that is that it seems like all the high sprens are basically following nail and bonding whoever like nail tells them to though it could be some sort of rogue high spren yeah Though it seems yeah. rather against their nature to go rogue. Yeah, but still did. I mean, still isn't a high spren. Yeah, but it's true. I mean, it's not impossible that, like... True. But, like, her entire society, like, Ivory, right? All right. the ink spren are very much anti-human, and Ivory was like, no, I'll go, I'll go bond one. Yeah. Oh, you know, that, that could make like for a cool scene of like, because Zeph's current spren is the one that like Nail, you know, that's yeah. hanging out with Nail and the official Skybreakers. So it, it would it be, it could be an interesting scene of like Zeph meeting his old would be spren again. Yeah. And it would be yeah. a weird moment, <laughs> definitely. Just running into your ex. Yeah. <laughs> Do I'm also actually thinking because like I'm thinking about a lot of things this episode. I'm thinking right now because he says in the in the third flashback that he would like to be able to talk to Espren about his the fact that adults in, in his life aren't consistent and that's normal, though he doesn't really get that at this yeah. point. And that that's in the context of like, well, how how do you know what is right and what is wrong, right? And the mm-hmm. and the farmer tells him, well. The spren teaches like it's the spren's teachings, right? And the and the stone shamans interpret those teachings and tell us how to live our lives. Uh, but ultimately, they seem that the shin seem to believe that the ultimate source of truth in the world are the spren, mm-hmm. yeah. which actually kind of nicely parallels this uh, the the thing from the prologue where Stormfather has apparently convinced Gavilar that that spren can't lie. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I I don't know if it was just me, but like I even though these were very peaceful, like to me there was almost this undercurrent of like 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 we know that Shinovar society is like messed up kind of and like Seth has this very sheltered like childhood kind of living away from town with his parents who are more lenient about things but like like even in this chapter he makes a comment of like oh I'm glad not to be like a farmer even though they're higher up like toiling in the fields all day and like I'm glad I'm not someone who subtracts either like I'm in the good good middle spot like I don't know it, it just felt like you like there's this almost undercurrent of like things are wrong in this society yeah definitely and like we we know how this ends, so there is still that calm before Poorly. the storm sort of tension. Yeah, yeah. The, like the storm clouds are are definitely gathering, right? Yeah, and like I imagine, like Sev is eventually going to tell someone about the stone that that, that his parents have moved. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Or or in the act of going back to find Molly, like he like. Because uh, his mother hid the stone a little bit, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So like maybe like something happens and like he like undoes that disguise and like the the farmer or someone else comes in and sees it. Oh yeah, because like they they made a point of the fact that there are like shovel marks on the stone. Yeah, and that's that's yeah. probably a religious crime around there. Uh, I mean, his mother, his mother does say that, oh, the farmer is not going to be too happy about that, but I'll bake him a cake. So I think it's, I, I don't think that's going to be the thing that like gives them to the honor blades, right? Yeah. Might put them on the radar as all oh, these, these people are doing shady stuff. It might be like they, you know, something happens and like, maybe they're not really in trouble, but there's sort of like a loss of trust between Seth and his parents yeah. and then the show, stone shamans are able to like whisper in his ear and kind of get yeah. in his head a little bit sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of like, oh, you said it was fine, face. but then we got in trouble for it. I'm also like, my, my train of thought was more along the lines of someone more like higher up the food chain shows up to deal with the with the raiders and that's who they get in trouble with because like Zeph's community is a bit of like, you know, they are close together. They all know each other well. So like with with the neighbors, it's normal. Like, oh, I made something bad, but I'll just make him a cake. But like if, for example, one of those honor blade bearers shows up to deal with the problem yeah. and they discover something, it's probably going to be more serious because I imagine you can't buy the stone shamans off with cake. Well, so, so I don't think the stone shamans are... The honor blade wielders. My impression from this was that that, that they're just two like separate groups, right? Uh, ah, the people right, who are right. trained with the honor blades are the servants of the monastery, and then the stone shamanate are the people who are kind of running society. Um, but but broadly speaking, yes, I think that would be interesting. And there is a little bit of mm-hmm. I don't know if it's foreshadowing, but if things develop that way, it could be foreshadowing uh, because we are told that Zeth lives in uh, Clearmont, which is close to the Zephyr Monastery. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Zephyr Monastery presumably is where Jezrian's Honor Blade is being kept. Uh, yeah. And then uh, they have, he and, and his sister, I think, have a brief conversation of, uh, oh, well, the soldiers are going to deal with the, the raiders and and one of them brings up the subject of uh oh but, but, but like the the servant might go and like or or i wonder how, like what the servant would do to like deal with so like i think there's the possibility that mm-hmm. if the danger is big enough uh one or more of the servants will like go out of their monasteries and like yeah. subtract yeah i mean i think yeah i think if a servant is called like there, that's like a leave no witnesses situation. Yeah, yeah, because because they are they're even like a f- they Zeth at least is afraid to speak of what the other blades can do out in the open, right? Uh, he's having a conversation with his sister, uh, and and he's like, oh, she can she can, uh, or she's like, oh, she can fly, and then he's like, 
And oh nope, 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 we don't don't talk about that out in the open. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was also thinking like if there's like if the Zephyr Monastery just has like Jezrian's honor blade and no one else is, I wonder if like there's gonna be a moment when his family is taken and they're all like separated to go to like where the different honor blades are. Oh yeah. Like I, don't I, know, I could like, see that. I, I'm just thinking also like that's that's like really sad. Like if if they get separated and Zeth is still really young and like with his own personality, he would be so easily manipulated, which like to be like your only job is to follow our rules now, which is kind of yeah. where he's at when we see him in the way of things. Yeah, you can I I I think it would be difficult timeline wise to do this this early. Mm-hmm. But you can definitely see echoes of this child in like kind of the truthless mentality. Yeah. It's it's interesting to me that Seth like grew up like this, whereas the re- his entire rest of the family is a lot more lax about it. More chill. Yeah. 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 I mean, some some children are, you know. True. Children sometimes fixate on things, right? Uh, and and sometimes that passes. Sometimes it doesn't. I'm, I'm I'm just so curious to see like how the rest of his family would react to being like taken for the honor blades if they're not as you know rule following. Like like if that is taken for the honor blades, he's like, yeah, no, this is right. I'm gonna do what I'm told. Like not question it but like for someone who's already an adult who already doesn't care as much about the rules how that sort of how they would react to that how they'd be treated compared in comparison yeah there's a world where they like try to break him out or something i don't think the story's headed that way but Mm -hmm. i think there's a there's a version where they're like oh no we need to save him and and he just refuses to go that that would be quite a crunchy chapter yeah. Or even like having having met his father. Like I I don't remember the exact passage if like Ishtar confirms that he killed Death's father for the blade, but like how much is Death's perception of like, oh my father would never give you that is actually correct. If Oh yeah. If Ishtar was able to promise him like I don't know if like like Death would never give up his blade. But like would would Zeth, would Naturo feel the same way if if Ishar was like I can like give you freedom I can give you your family I can give you I don't know what exactly what he would want I think Ishar says that Naturo thanked him Mm. which is interesting yeah so the the exact passage is um, so Zeph is like my father's sword where did you get it what have you done to my father and later, like, my people are not going to return your weapons to you. You lie if you say my father gave you that blade. And then Ishar says, your father was barely a man when I found him. The Shin had accepted the unmade. Try to make gods of them. I saved them. And your father did give me this blade. He thanked me for letting him die. Mm. Well, there is this ominous purple thing in my background <laughs> uh which is which is a, a concept piece for stormlight 5 uh if you are not watching the video uh, it shows kaladin and seth in shinovar and there's like a, a purple rainbow bubble thing unclear in the distance um which combined with what we just read um mm-hmm. from rhythm of war certainly suggests that at least one unmade uh, either has made its way into Shinovar or has been in Shinovar and is now like activated. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if it could be like Badom Ishram. Because we know mm-hmm. she's hidden somewhere and like she has experience acting like a god. <laughs> and it would be a way to like bring these two like plot lines together. I, I don't know if. 
I mean, we, we have like zero idea at this point who this could be. So I'm just yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. speculating yeah. completely. No, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember because it sounds like. Uh, but how much you trust Ishar in this sequence mm-hmm. is is uh, up for debate. But it sounds mm-hmm. like whichever unmade was there was like forcefully keeping people alive, presumably through some kind of physical or emotional or psychological torture. I mean, that, that's, they can't... That, and, and that's why Naturo pres- mm-hmm. like, allegedly thanked Ishar for letting him die. I mean, I, my money's on Dagonorthus. Um, yes! Black Fisher. Yeah, he's, he's like one of... How, because like he's like the one unmade that hasn't made any presence in the story at the moment, I yeah. think, is he? Yeah. Because like all but it's the... also, I don't know, like the whole like the black fisher holds my sorrow and consumes it. I don't know. That feels like it could be like a shin thing. I was like, I'm I'm looking up like the list of all the unmade to I mean it's that, it's the, the dust mother, right? Right. Um I think, I think we like know... those are the only two that we know nothing about at this point in the present day. Yeah, off the top of my head. Um, Diagon Arthas was allegedly involved in the destruction of Amia, which is a question mark as well. It's geographically close. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I personally, until it comes out, I also like to believe that it's Asher Marn again, and like the Shin just have a giant like orgy going on. Because <laughs> I think that's a fun concept. Um, like these very, you know, pious rule following stone shaman just letting go because of Asher Marn. Just full hiddenism. I don't think that's likely. I just think it's a funny thing to think about. K- Kaladin and Zev just arrive in Shinova. It, ter- it, it turns out it's just Las Vegas. It's it's bone town. I like I like that my brain brain went into infinite unending torture that you need to die to be saved from, and you were like. They just, just sex all the time, just, I mean, just nonstop. I mean, we saw Asher Martin. It's not necessarily Look. mutually exclusive with what we saw in the light in Kolinar. Yeah, that's 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 true, actually. Yeah, no, but I'm 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 I'm, I'm all for Dagonardis. I've been low low key, just like hyped for for Dagonardis uh, to show this up. This is your bad, Omishram. It's it's not quite that level. It's not quite that level. My my, my bottom issue are are others' purposes. Um, I see. But uh, but Dagon Arthas. yeah, give me, give me, give me, give me. I I'm actually wondering if we're going to see Elid in the present day plot. I hope so. Like this is because how, how old is Zephyr? He's like thirty seven, isn't he? In the uh, in the present thirties, yeah. Yeah. So like he's. We know his dad is dead, and I don't have high hopes of, for his mom, to be honest, given the whole situation. So, but I do wonder if we're going to see Elid in the present day times. Uh, I hope so. I really hope so. I, I think she would be a fun character uh, in its own right, and also a character to like interact with Zeth, right? Someone, someone mm-hmm. from his past, uh, mm-hmm. and someone that he was close to. And like, if we need like a character to tell us what's going on in Shinova, she's already been introduced. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it like, uh, it might be too obvious and easy of a thing to do, but like, Zeth and Kaladin go to Shinova, and like, they they find signs of trouble somewhere, and they're like, okay, let's go investigate, and they run into in it. And she's like, okay, let me let me give you a recap of what's been <laughs> happening here. Oh, or potentially the stone shamans send her to fight them Ooh. if they're not wanted in Shinobar. Ooh. And she has an honor blade. Maybe. I don't know if they would... I mean, things could have changed since then, but mm-hmm. my impression is that they just they don't just send the servants <laughs> out there. Yeah. But to reclaim an honor blade... Yeah, but he doesn't. Does Death still have his? Sorry, it's been. Oh no, yeah, oh, it was taken a while Mosh. ago. Yeah. Mosh. Mosh has it now. But like, do the stone shamans know about this fact? 
Like for all they know, it could be just they, they can see that Steph is here and he can fly. And he has some sort of sword with him. And unless they send someone to check personally, like it's probably the easiest to assume that if the man you send out with a sword that lets you fly comes back with a sword and the ability to fly. Fair. That's fair. <laughs> I will argue that this makes for a less interest, interesting story because Zeth's whole shtick is I am here to purge this land. Mm, and yeah. uh, I also and have night blood on my back. And being welcomed with blades is like justifying that where it's like if he's welcomed with open arms and being told that he was right all along, maybe his he'll have some conflict on whether or not to actually Ooh. purge the country. And even and even Ooh, without like that, uh it's just it it doesn't further the story, I think, to send like soldiers against them, essentially. Right. Mm-hmm. At the very best, it delivers another honor blade in his hands or whatever. Um, but if there's no honor blade in there, then this is just like a minor obstacle that the two of them have to go through, uh, which is not interesting to me. Do you think they'll encounter Tolm's missing honor blade in Shinovar? Oh, who even has that? Oh, it's it's been stolen last we heard, it, and that's it, like... Yeah. Actually, like, because like the stone shamans did say that they had the capacity to reclaim yeah. Zeph's honor blade yeah. if he lost it. So maybe this is what happened to Talon's honor blade. Maybe like the stone shamans grabbed it. It yeah, would be I, kind of weird and silly, but like maybe that's what happened. I, I mean, I guess it's possible. But the the fact like w- we were told it was swapped. Which mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I, they can't. Like, there's nothing that I can think of that contradicts that. It just feels like the most boring explanation of, but but also, I don't like. I want to say ghost bloods, but I don't feel ghost bloods. Um, yeah, like I, I feel like if they had it, they would have used it by now to do something mm-hmm. else. Yeah, it would have just been sitting in Ray's collection. <laughs> so a lot of people would have come in. It's just like there's a sharp blade there, and the description just there's matches. A, tall. There's a flower. There are some uh, hairpins. And there's a, a seven foot blade <laughs> that looks suspiciously oh, like the painting of Tom Sharp blade, or Tom Otter Blade that I saw in the in the Warren Holy site. Right. Yeah. And, but like the, the the thing is like the mystery of Tom's missing honor blade is like a mystery that got set up and then literally nothing was done with it. But yeah. I, I I wouldn't even say it was set up. It was like foreshadowed. Very subtly, in a way that the audience isn't necessarily designed to pick up on immediately. And I don't think most people who read the books pick up on that. I think I, I was sure that, like, either in like Obringer or Rhythm of War, they like say it openly that it, it's not the right blade, but I'm not sure right now, actually. I think oh. at some point they do, but it's like. Yeah. It first, I, I mean, I still think like it first happens at like the very end of Way of Kings, and then like it's mentioned once in like Rhythm of War or whatever. Like, I still, I feel like that's subtle enough that it could be like a back half mystery type thing. Maybe this is what Tan's book will be about—just Tan going around asking people who took his sharp blade. Where is it? Yeah, it's it's such a weird mystery because there's so. Yeah. It's supposed to be like one of those super special extra blades that give you powers, but there's so little time spent on, you know, thinking about it. There's a lot going on. True. I'm just, I'm just a bit worried that's going to go the way of the pure like plague where it's like set up and then it just fizzles into random background detail. Yeah, but I, I think that was always meant to be a, like a, just a flavor thing. I'm I'm still so disappointed that this wasn't part of Rabaniel's Rabaniel's <laughs> plotline. Given that, like, she was, they, ex- I'm sorry, they set her up explicitly that she created a plague the last time she was around, and then we got do nothing with her plague. That was four thousand years ago, <laughs> and, and it didn't work. Like, it went out, and it didn't like it, it. It killed a bunch of people, but like, it didn't do what it was supposed to. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll just. 
it's just one of my long-standing disappointments with okay. Rhythm of War. Fair, <laughs> fair. I do wanna, I do wanna briefly mention that I like the idea of a splash in in Shin culture. Mm. The fact that they are dressing in like whites and grays and like these these plain clothes, and then they all have like this splash of color uh, to them. And uh, the higher your station is, the the bigger your splash is. I think that's cool. The plain clothes actually reminds me of like the the singer fashion. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, where they they dress. Although they 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 don't stick with like whites and grays and stuff like that. They they stick with like muted colors to accentuate the coloration of their. Uh, of their skin yeah, patterns. but like yeah. I, I could see like both those like clothing mm. styles developing from the same source. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think they serve different purposes. So yeah, not I don't buy that, but it's possible. Because uh, for the shin, it's it's like a matter of of modesty, right? Right. Hey, I I have this plain thing, and then ah vibrancy. I like that that Zeth's splash is like a bright red scarf, uh, which is kind of a, a cool visual. A girl who looked up almost. Yeah. Ooh, that, 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 like the girl who looked up is just Ooh. like Zeth reimagined. And that's <sighs> like, like I know. Okay, I know this sort of was a joke, but actually, like <laughs> I, I feel like thematically, his arc more than anyone does match that story. Okay, so the girl, the girl goes around and is like, "Why is there a wall?" And and none of the people are acknowledging the presence of the wall. There mm-hmm. are parallels here, right? Yeah, and then like like more drawn out. Like he's like, "Hey, this friend told me like, I mean, this friend talked to me. Like he's labeled a uh, you know truthless. He's sent out to the world, and then he like learns that." The shin and you know being truthless was the lie all along, sort of. And that's when like the girl who looks up comes back and realizes that her people were the monsters. Well, so she does that halfway through the journey, right? She goes up oh. yeah. uh, on the wall and is like, "Oh, there are spikes on the inside. This wall is meant to keep people in," which which we for a long time have recognized as a parallel for or a metaphor for the history of Roshar, right? Yeah. The humans come in and they're given this land and told, hey, you stay here. This is your land. So that has always been the case. It's interesting now that you bring that up. Uh, it's interesting to consider the second half of the story in which the girl comes back with mm-hmm. God's light. And, and also brings the storms with her. Yeah, Kaladin, son of Tenevast. <laughs> God, God, life, God, child. He was oh, the light of his life. God damn it, Grace. Okay, but does that imply that the Kaladin and Zev going to Shinovar is going to somehow ruin the wreck the mountains that protect Shinovar? So that would be a quite a grand, grand and dramatic finale to their, well, their side mean, of the plot. People, people want Rashar to be destroyed. I always think that's too too big, but like a little terraforming. We could have a little ruined mountain range. Knock out Shinovar, the one part of Roshar that's still Earth-like. Make it, you know, make it like the rest of the planet. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's anything that's going to happen to the, yeah. to the mountains. If anything, maybe like the storms become more dangerous. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I mean, I'm not here saying like, Zeth is the girl who lucked up. His story will match it exactly. I just think it's interesting that like, you know, thematically, I think of our main characters, his story in some ways matches that the best. And now we see him with a red scarf. Yeah, I mean, you're not, you're not necessarily wrong. I think that's, that's an interesting thing to like, consider and keep in mind as we learn more about his backstory mm-hmm. in these flashbacks. God's light can also be like, he brings this friend back. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, we we are told that Spren are like originally we thought there were no Spren in in Shinovar, uh from from Risen, but that's wrong. They're just very rare. Yeah, 
So maybe maybe they come back for some reason. Okay, maybe to my to my prior theory that this could be bad Mishram, she it does have like connection with the void sprint, so maybe they bring if Bado Mishram like takes up residence, permanent residence in Shinovar, maybe oh. the void sprint just congregate there. That would have I don't like it, but that would have a, a kind of a cool parallel with the history of Roshar, where humans as the void bringers start off in Shinovar and then they expand out. Mm-hmm. And now we are in a place where the humans have expanded out and they're no longer considered to be the void bringers. What if we repeat that cycle again? We start off in Shinovar with the true void bringers, like Odium's forces and whatever. And that serves as a staging ground for them to like take over the rest of the world. I, I guess my, that my doesn't thought- fully work because they've already taken over a bunch of kingdoms, but my I admit my thought process didn't really go that far. <laughs> well, I like a farmer like to add. Uh, I don't know if I have any more interesting things to say about Zeth's stuff. There's like minor cultural things that I thought were interesting. Like uh, when they talk about raiders, the, the raiders, Illid is like, they, they think nothing of a stone. They don't feel or commune with them. They ignore the spren. I don't know how cultural that is and how, or, or how like factual it is. Uh, like, do, do the Shin actually commune with the Spren in some way? I don't think so. I think if anyone speaks with the Spren, it is the Stone Shamans. Uh, but I'm skeptical that even they do. Yeah, like, Zev did say that, like, he has seen Spren three times in his life at the time, and that was, like, so brief, he yeah. didn't have enough time to stop being surprised. Yeah. But if we have nothing else... Mm-hmm. We can go and talk about the final preview chapter that we have on the menu today. And it's Yasna. So uh, for this one, Yasna is sort of laying in bed next to Hoyt and she's like, she does not like the bed. She's like, this is so uncomfortable. It's like too soft. I'm just like thinking it's the mattress. And she's thinking about like the ways that Hoyt has, you know, lied to her and she's been like, told him to like you know stop making wordplay and then he like wouldn't he just made it like more obscure so she wouldn't notice and how she's like super unhappy and doesn't feel she can trust him and also about how like they're not really connecting like physically or emotionally the way either one of them wants and then Hoid who is apparently like can kind of visit other worlds while he's asleep um wakes up and like absolutely panicked and Yasna's like, what's going on? Tell me. And Hoy starts, you know, writing. And then eventually he's like, I was t- making a note of my memories, keeping track of like going through them, seeing which ones were important, which ones I could get rid of. And I realized that I have three minutes of, and three and a half basically minutes of time missing from when I was talking to Odium and that he somehow got the better of me and then took that and made me think that I got the better of him. Uh, And there is something very, very wrong here because that is not like something race would do. And then they go off to, I think, talk to Dalinar, right? Well, uh, notably, we are told that Adolin and Shalan have... Oh, yes. ...returned, right? Or or there's a message. That was redacted. Uh, It's notably redacted so that we're, to keep the mystery alive of what they returned to say. Oh, and, and they also decide that, oh, we should, we should review the contract with Odium. Yeah. Because uh, maybe we missed something. Yeah. Boyd was like, there's a loophole. I need to reread this contract. Yeah. And he will reach out to an old friend, whoever that might be. Uh, so I'll say this chapter to me spells out the end of their relationship. Yes. That is, I, like, I don't know how long that's going to take. Might take until the rest of the book. Might take another chapter or two. But the way I see things, at some point, Hoyt's going to be like, hey, look, baby girl, I got to go and mm-hmm. do like Cosmere things. 
don't be too sad. And Yasna's going to be like, I'm not going to be sad at all. I actually think it's going to be the opposite. I think also this is a little bit structure based. We know um, like Dalinar is with like Shala, Navani, and Renarin, and Yasna's kind of off to her own thing. I think Wit will like stay with Dalinar in preparation for this duel, and Yasna's going to be like, I got something else I need to figure out. You know, you can hang out with my uncle and figure out this dual stuff and I'm going to go do something else. Yeah, like Hoyt is kind of a terrible boyfriend. Yeah. 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 And like, but in general... Surprising. Is there yeah. anyone surprised in the ways that he's Not terrible? really. Just like... I didn't, I didn't think he would be that bad. Yeah. Like, and generally, like, Yasna has, has a poor luck with... Yasna's love life is just terrible across what Brandon has written because like in in Way of Kings Prime oh. she like she dates Talon and then in Way of Kings Prime spoilers for that by the way uh, Talon just dies or seemingly dies at the end there and now here she she's dating Hoyd and this is like a terrible relationship that's clearly dying look girl girl has a type and the type is immortals. I, I do so. I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, mm-hmm. as as I am I am want to do. Uh, I think about the Asna a lot, and I agree that Hoyd is just a bad partner. Like they're 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 clearly not communicating well enough. They're not meeting each other's expectations for one reason or another. Uh, they're just. They're a bad pairing. Uh, th- their needs are, are, are very different. I think there is a little bit of this that is excusable. And I say that because I feel like Hoyd approaches this relationship or has been approaching this relationship much more casually than Yasna has. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Which, which is, I think, one of the sources of their, uh, of like, uh, like disconnect in 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 communication and stuff like that, hmm. right? I think for Hoyd, this is kind of like, I mean, this, uh, I, I will say this in a very in a very mercenary kind of way, uh, but I don't truly mean it in that capacity. But he sees it as. This is the best this world has to offer, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think he is fond of Yasna. I, I, I'm, I'm confident that he's fond of her, right? But he's not, like, in love with her. And I don't think she is in love with him either, but I think she finds him fascinating and interesting in a way that nothing and no one else on her world has been yeah and so like, she's a lot more invested in this relationship mm-hmm. that, than he ever was uh yeah. for him for him for him this is a fling this this is in the span life of an immortal this is a one night stand and for her it's a partnership yeah so yeah it does like it is like the lack of communication that's killing this relationship because they clearly have different ideas of what this relationship is supposed to be. Yeah. So I think they are communicating. I just don't think that, like, I think they are trying to communicate. Like, I don't think Yasna has kept quiet about what she wants. And, and I, I just don't think that communication is, like, doing the thing that it's supposed to. Yeah. I mean, I think also Yasna kind of had that moment when she thinks, like, Oh, well, like, I mean, I knew I, I'm trying to court the God. Like, what did I expect? Yeah. 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 And like, Hoyt doesn't seem to be responding to what, like, she is telling him, like, what she doesn't like about what he's doing. But she, he, instead of like him actually taking this to heart, he's just doubling down and making this more like harder to notice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that, that's the other side of this, right? He is, for him, this is so casual. Like, when Yasna is like, hey, heart to heart, what you are doing here is you are shutting me down 
uh, or shutting me out of like important conversations and information that I would like to know, like you're being too frivolous. Just can you like be serious and like keep me in the loop and stuff like that? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll do that. I'll listen to you. I'll, I'll, I'll meet your needs. And then all he does is like makes it more difficult for her to realize that he's still playing the same games. Yeah. Yep. Which to him is like, oh, that's fun because I like playing games. And so I like the challenge of figuring out that someone else is playing a game. Like to him, that's fun and exciting and interesting and what he would want. And he's not realizing that Yasna is not like that. Hmm. Yeah. Hoyd, Hoyd, I think, it needs like a Catwoman figure if he if he wants a like long term relationship, like a kind of like what, like like I'm like like I feel like if Hoyd is gonna have like a long term relationship with anyone, it's gonna be like someone who also like pops up on random worlds and has their yeah. own agenda and likes playing games and like like sort of the thrill of the chase is as much what makes it interesting as like the actual relationship type thing. Yeah. And that's not who Yasna is. Yeah. No. Kind of kind of someone that he like runs into here and there, or like they do a job together or a project together, and then they they like have hot steamy connection and then they go off their separate ways and then they run into each other again, right? Something like that. Mm. Someone someone who enjoys trying to get the better of him as much as he enjoys trying to get the better of them. Very much a Loki kind of figure, right? Hoyd, yeah. that, 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 that's the thing, right? Hoyd, Hoyd is Loki, and the partner he needs is female Loki. <laughs> it's a bit of a pity that we don't really have another World Hopper character like that. It's like, do we? Because like all the, all the other... Kelsier. Consider Kelsier, though. But like, but think about it. Okay, but like Hoyt Kelsier ship is totally a thing. I'm sure it is. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. It absolutely yeah. it has to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are. You know, I'm sure there are people from Yolan like reshattering like the same mm-hmm. age that are not vessels that are you know still hopping around. Uh, not vessels, not dragons. I should say. Yeah, and like. Actually, like speaking of like Hoyd and his like relationship stuff, like in general, it seems that he has trouble being open and honest with people he gets closer to, weirdly. Like, cause like he, he's friendly enough with like Kaladin and Shalan, but like when it, someone like gets closer to the real Hoyd, then that relationship just plummets. Like, so. Hoyt and Yasna's terrible love light aside, love life yeah. aside, there is yeah. other stuff happening in this yeah. chap- this chapter actually. Yeah, it is. I have a I have a, a very mixed opinion of like uh, Hoyt waking up and like just doing a, a showy display of powers real quick because that's like first of all super fan servicey. Like mm-hmm. as a fan of just the Cosmere in general, Hoyt rapidly cycling through multiple magic systems that he has access to is is just flat cool like that's Mm -hmm. no questions asked this is yep i want that give me more of that (laughs) but in the context of the scene i have a little bit of a hard time seeing it as anything but fan servicey well my I'm like, my take on this was like, he was, he was trying to figure out like he's missing something. And my understanding was that he was trying to check if we hasn't lost any of his magic systems. I have to think about that some more because my impression was that he knew he was missing a memory and he went and like wanted to find out how much and where or, or when. My yeah, my 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 take on that was that like he he knew he was missing something and like he went through like to quickly make sure that something he was missing wasn't like say allomancy or whatever else he has there. Yeah, but I think he started writing like that table 
from the start, which yeah. I assume was like essentially a calendar. I mean, I my my theory, and this this I don't know if this like checks out mechanically, but my theory is that he was sort of like pushing away as much as he could of like the sort of excess unnecessary investiture. So all he has to deal with is like these are the bits of investiture I use to expand my soul, and like for this brief period of time, I don't have anything else in me that would be like clouding that. Yeah, but why why steel push like? Alamancy doesn't keep any investiture in your body. And as far as we know, neither does Sand Mastery, right? Mm -hmm. And and then like his clothes, his awakened clothes wriggle a little bit. Like that's not that's completely external to him. I mean, it could have been like he know he realizes that he has lost memories and is trying to see like in these three minutes I've lost, has someone taken away one of my powers? Yeah, I mean, and it, it, it doesn't even have to be like, I don't know, maybe it was like something that he was doing to like check on his memories had a similar effect to like Dural Lumen. And I mean, there there could be mechanical reasons going on underneath. I don't really know. I mean, mm. or he was just panicking and like using it subconsciously because like he, he even like loses for a moment. He's like with this guy's. Yeah. Yeah. Wh- which is an interesting because vi- like we see like a like a smoke billow out of him and then leave him as as his mm-hmm. his true self which i had i had always assumed he like physically shapeshifts uh in the way that returned do or can do mm-hmm. but this sounds more like light weaving huh. i i always assumed he was using like the the yol yol and light weaving for this yeah yeah, yeah. And, and this is this is certainly consistent with Yolish light weaving, where yeah. he uses like props to make the illusions. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it could just be the equivalent of like like if you if you woke up and were like, I, oh no, I just storms, I just realized that I lost my foot and didn't know when. Like your reaction is gonna be, I'm going to wiggle and check every other body part to make sure it's still there. Like it could just be that sort of thing. I don't think it's Yolish light weaving. And the reason I say that is because Yasna notes that he becomes shorter mm-hmm. when he does this. And if, if this is just an illusion to make him look taller, they would have a hard time making out successfully. <laughs> that just the mental image. So like she would go for a smooch and she's going to smooch his nose. So I think he's physically. Now I'm like wondering what's what's up with the smoke then? Like what what is the smoke? The magic system we haven't seen yet, probably. Is this like his excess flesh falling off him? Like what's going I mean, on there? Honestly, honestly, maybe <laughs> kind of. That's a terrible like thing to do to someone. Like Yasna's housekeeper is going to have to dust off bits of hoid from the mattress. Well, I mean, that's that's what dust is anyway, so. Yeah. I mean, you know, you make a good point here. <laughs> also, I don't know, maybe, maybe it goes off and, like, just flies into the air and dissipates. Maybe it's smoke. And, and then, at the end, they realize they've been made, mm-hmm. and there's probably an issue with the contract. Yep. And... I, I have a thing I want to talk about relating to yep. this. Mm-hmm. Uh, old friend, it's Frost. I feel... I feel pretty confident on that one. I, I think that seems likely, right? They said, like, oh, the only expert in the area isn't talking to me. I think that's cultivation. cultivation. Yep. We know from recent interviews that dragons take contracts very seriously, um, and they're looking for someone to look one over. Plus, oh, we've yeah. had all the letters to Frost as, like, beginnings of different, like, epigraphs throughout the book. Doesn't he also address him as old friend in like yeah, the first I think letter? So. Yeah. Or I, I know I know one of them does. I don't remember if it's Hoyt the Frost or Frost Hoyt, but I'm I'm kind of this is making me kind of wonder, like, because Frost never leaves Yolen. That's like a thing for him, right? For example, like because we know that they're they are communicating through letters. So like someone has to presumably like physically carry the letters through to 
And I'm kind of wondering, because the thing that keeps catching me on Stormlight 5 is the matter of time. Because 10 days is not a lot of time when we have a story that spans the entirety of the continent. And so, like, Freud having to bring them, communicate two-way communication with Frost over the span of 10 days. I don't know how fast those Shadesmar careers are, but that seems a bit improbable, which is actually reminding me, because just recently in the interview with Brandon, he was talking about like how Tamuk X can be used to commune mm. with dragons. Yeah. So it's making mm-hmm. me wonder if, if like the initial part of, like either Co- Hoyt has a Tamuk X already and just hasn't been using it because, you know, he's been bothering Frost too much with it and Frost has put him on hold perpetually. <laughs> uh, or, Marked him a spam. Or, <laughs> or the like initial section of the plot concerning Hoyt will be him trying to like get his hands on a Tamukek or a Sion. Yeah. Uh, well, he does yeah. have a Sion, right? Yeah. All right. He, he does have Ayla, which is like, Brandon, why did you name? No, no, no. Uh, Shalan has. Oh, Ayla. Shalan has Ayla. Yeah. Sorry. That, the, the name of this friend lives rent free in my head. Gosh, wonder why. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if I will maybe talk about like, oh, Brandon has obviously been writing something with dragons with the lore he dropped. It's like, could easily be Stormlight 5 with this discussion. Like, oh. wait, or like, who knows, maybe Frost will make an appearance. Oh, that'd be wild. Yeah, that, that would be incredible if just we get casually just dragon being there. Yeah. It would be even funnier if he like never transforms into his dragon form and he's just this weird old man. This is um, uh, the, a slight aside from Stormlight 5, but it's kind of a meta Cosmere narrative point uh, that I just thought of. It's interesting how when, when the Cosmere first started, right, there were certain things that, uh, well, not, not at the very, very beginning, but like the early age of the Cosmere, like by the time Way of Kings was coming out and stuff like that. There were certain things that were kind of known from Brandon's writing group and like from his posts on Time Wasters Guide and from like Dragon Steel Prime. So like there there was a certain amount of background Cosmere knowledge that we all had back in the day. Adenalsium, uh shards, things like that. And it's it's interesting to see and so, like, a lot of the discourse around what's happening in the Cosmere was informed and sometimes centered on these things that were, okay, we have the books, we have this obscure background knowledge, how do the books connect with that? And it's, and it's interesting to see how, like, Fain Life, great example for that. It's interesting to see how, as the books are catching up, with all of this background stuff, they are also establishing uh, more background knowledge for us to explore, right? Uh, Frost, for example. Uh, I don't know if, like, I don't think we knew a Frost back before before the first letter. Well, I, I, I there's a word to Brandon somewhere about something. Uh, but like, we generally didn't know anything about him. And now the books have established some lore about him so that when we inevitably meet him far in the future, we have all of this almost foreshadowing kind of, oh, that's this thing that we've known so much about for so long. And now we get to meet him, which I think will be a cool reveal. Mm-hmm. We've had like quite a few like dragon foreshadowing bits with like, with Rhythm of War and with Tress and with Yumi. Yumi does have like, Yumi mostly has dragons as just like being a cultural thing, not actual presence of dragons. Yeah, I don't think there's any dra- I mean, it's the toy. It's the plushie. <laughs> and there are decorations on the buildings. Uh, okay, fine. Yes, okay. I, I am not going to file that under, like, I'm not putting that on the dragon I, I would- page. <laughs> Okay, just, I, I would say it's not like a presence of dragons on page, but just like a reminder to the reader that dragons sure. are a thing. Sure. 
But yeah, I do. It would be cool if we actually got a dragon, another dragon on page in, yeah. in the Cosmere book. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we will, right? It's just a matter of time. Yeah, but it would be fun to have one like sooner rather than later. Especially when that's like an established character at this point. Yeah, Frost, Frost is... We, we were hyped for Zeiss, for Foil. Mm-hmm. Frost is going to be more exciting. Yeah, and I, I really think there's like a nod, a pretty good chance that he shows off the con page in this book. Could just wow. be like a letter back or something. But it would not surprise me if at some point, like at the end of part one, this, this like man walks in and Dalinar is like, who are you? And then Hoyd's like, He's he's my lawyer. I called him. Stay like frosty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, calling Frost Hoyd's lawyer. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, I mean Hoyd, Hoyd would be like, this is my contract lawyer just with Frost, right? Le- like, legal advisor. Yeah. And then Frost just like slaps him over the head for it. Objection! <laughs> the, only, the only other note from this uh, chapter that I have is to call out that Hoyt appears to have not only access to White Sand, uh, mm-hmm. which I, I wish we had like a better name for that. Because like, I, I guess White Sand is fine, but like Taldanian Sand is not, I don't like that. And calling well, it just not, sand. It's not necessarily Taldanian. It's the spore. It's the, it can be grown on any sand if you have a sample. Yeah, I guess. But anyway, so he does, he does have access to that, which is not unusual, like Robonio had that, and apparently it's, yeah. it's widely available in the Cosmere. Uh, but he also can master it. He's a sound master, which we didn't know before. I don't think we did. You know, for, for a planet that's supposedly like cut off from the rest of Cosmere, there's a lot of white sun stuff making its way out into the Cosmere. And it's, but it's, you just need to smuggle a little bit off, and then you can make so much more so easily. Well, uh, but you you have to charge it somehow, right? The because the 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 microflora well, still uncharged. I, I mean, like it has a use uncharged as yeah, much as it does charge. Like like in some ways, for people outside Taldane, it's almost more useful uncharged because then it's like, oh, I'm paper. selling you this useful tool. It didn't let you know if uh, if there are people using investiture around you. You know, yeah. you, it's less work for you and you can, you know, spin it to, to, you know, upsell it, make it more expensive than the charged stuff. Yeah. And like, even like back in Oathbringer, like this thing got charged just from Shallan being around it. So it's not really with, like. With an illusion on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, it clearly doesn't require like a huge amount of investiture to, to get charged. I mean, just like. I was going to say Theodora, and I, that's not the name of Fendorana at all. Um, <laughs> just like Fendorana, like flying over it was enough to like charge it a little bit. So like, and, and spread are everywhere on Roshar. Yeah. yeah. Almost makes you wonder if it's like, if it should be half useless on the Roshar, because like it just, like, as, as a detector, because like spread are just charging it all of the time. I mean, Fendorana is a bit of a special case compared to most Roshan sprints. She is yeah. like a radiant sprint. Yeah, she is, she's thick with investiture. I mean, I think you mean was. <laughs> yep. Rude. Just rude. Just, just rude. I don't, I don't have any more things on, on this chapter. I, I do we want to talk about like the, the contract lap, loophole? What that could be? So, I mean, I've, I've spent some time reading through the, the Rhythm of War chapter trying to figure out. I mean, I think the, the best thing I've come up with is, like, maybe Teravangian pulls the same trick he was hoping against Odium and is like, oops, I conquered all of Roshar in the past ten days. I don't, I don't think that's it. I, I could not figure it out personally. I am... This, this immediately reminded me of the meme of the guy holding a bunch of limes oops uh, i can hold all these all these lemons but it's teravangian and it's like oops i can't hold all these nations <laughs> it's the nations of rashar spilling actually since you, you are the one to last review this contract tell me is there anything about like 
time limits beyond like 10 days until the, the contest? Like, is there anything about how long the contest takes? I mean, I don't think so. It's um, to the death. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm like... Uh... Well, the thing is, so, so here's my thinking, right? And, and this is sort of the other way that I'm thinking the loophole is in sort of in this vein, is that if either of them break the deal, they're in the other's power. So I think what I actually think is going to happen is Teravangian has found a way that he believes he can force Dalinar to break his side of the deal. Oh, no, I'm convincing myself... Child champion, I think I'm convincing myself into the child champion theory. (laughs) No, what have you done to me? What is it? (laughs) I mean, I think if there was, like, a duel and Dalinar had the chance to kill the uh, champion and didn't take it, that would break the terms of the duel and would put him in Odium's power. I don't think it's going to be a thing where it's like, the duel takes our lifespan. Like, I don't think that's, I don't think that's possible yeah. under the terms of the duel. Yeah. No, I don't like child champion theory, but it, it could be the loophole. No. I really struggle with child champion because the champion has to be like a, a, yeah. a, a consenting person. Like, it's, it's not just, you know, Taravangian like plucks, uh, 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 what's Orden. his face? Uh, I, well, not Oradin, Gavinor, yes. Uh, just grabs him by the scruff of his neck and plops him on top of your hero and is like, that's my champion, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I it's... think I think that is the biggest issue with child champion theory. But also like Shalom was swearing truths as a kid. Like consenting in terms of yeah. like what that means in terms of gods and spread and bonds is a tricky situation. Yeah, that's true. I think if I were actually to say what I think the loophole is, I think Teravangian believes he's found a way where he can follow the rules of the contract technically, but force Dalinar to break his based off his own innate sense of honor. Yeah. Yeah. So I I admit my my theory was significantly more boring than that, because like I'm still hung up on the on the fact that like the time span for this book is so tight where we have so much to do and so many places to go to because like i like adeline and shalom like there it took them a while to get from orifiro to like uh, the Hon- honor sprint city yeah to lasting integrity and to lasting integrity and now they are back so i like Maybe they found a way to send word to a wraith through and down Lars that like couple wind runners to pick them up. Like, yeah, I mean, I they like, they yeah. spoke with Hoyd. Like at the end of, they used the Sion to yeah. to call Hoyd, and Hoyd was like, "Hey, tell Thydekar, blah 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 blah." Right. Yeah, I mean, I I think there's ways. Like, I don't think travel time is a huge issue. They, if they just like, I mean, if they manage to get to the physical realm somehow, then all it really takes is like. Sending a wind runner through the nearest oath gate in their back of the day. Yeah. And lasting integrity is like far in the west. So like Azimir is probably close enough, right? Maybe Kalak could get them through. Like that is he's like the wheel shaper, right? They have the power of transportation. No, wait, he he doesn't have his sword. Yeah, he needs his blade for that. All right. So that's that's idea. That idea is gone. But yeah, my, my my idea, my thought was that Taravangian somehow manages to like extend the contest to last, like say the contest begins at the end of part three of the book, and then the the other two parts, the contest is still ongoing, and Taravangian manages to do something during that time. Oh, during the contest, wow, it's going on. Yeah, yeah like it's not like he's not trying to like outlive Dalinar. He's trying, like, maybe what one of you said earlier about, like, conquering all of Roshar while yeah. Dalinar is tied up in the contest. Maybe, maybe we just seen, like, in The Princess Bride, and it's like a duel of wits, but one of the chalices is poisoned, but then <laughs> Teravangian has made himself immune to the poison. It's, it's actually just that scene from The Princess Bride in, in <laughs> Sword <Sword-like> 5. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, it's just a duel to the death. It doesn't say what kind of duel. The first half of Stormlight Archive ending with a massive Princess Bride reference would be quite a power move. <laughs> Dalinar falling for these one of the classic blunders. 
I love it. Uh, I don't, I don't have any thoughts on the, on the contract. I, from day one, when the book came out, people were like, Oh, what's the loophole? And I'm like, I am too dumb to figure out what the loophole <laughs> is. I'll just wait. I'll, I'll read and find out. So I think, I think we've covered all of the chapters, but we do have a little more information from Brandon's Reddit update in particular which characters' chapters are going to be connected. So first group, pretty obvious based off what we read, Kaladin's that that's not a surprise to anyone. Um, second group, which I think is interesting, is mainly Shalon and Dalinar with some Navanian rhetoric. Um, and the third group is not an interconnected plot, but that he is writing together, and because they all have a chunk of the book, is Edelin, Yasna, and Venli. So I think the, the thing that's interesting to a lot of people there is the fact that Shalon and Adolin are separated in this book. Yeah. Yeah, the, the fact that like uh, Shalon is staying with Dalinar while Adolin is having his own plotline is making me think like Adolin is going to be the one hunting for Bado Mishram while Shalon mm-hmm. is helping out with the Contest of Champions prep work. Hmm. Yeah. I definitely think that, like, in terms of the contest of champions, Adolin, like, what's he really going to do, you know? Yeah. yeah but I don't know what Shalon's really going to do on the prep work either, but, you know. I almost wonder if it's, like, if there's a world where it goes the other way, where Shalon goes after Baromishram and she needs... Dalinar because needs a bondsmith with her? she needs a bondsmith, yeah. Ooh, but, like, but no, if Navani's connected there, I feel like Navani has to stay in the Rithril. I it don't can see she her. Leave? I mean, like I think I think Navani will stay in the Rithril, like with her connection to the sibling. She probably could leave if necessary, but Yeah. Like I'm sure I'm sure she like loses a lot of her power when she's away from the tower, because like yeah. Well, no, I was thinking about Dalinar and the Stormfather. The Stormfather doesn't directly infuse Dalinar, but Dalinar can open a perpendicularity regardless of where he is. What if, what if Navani can just like open an oath gate wherever she is? An oath gate? Don't you like need special strength for that? Probably, yeah. I just, th- I just thought it was a funny parallel of like, <laughs> oops, I need to get back to to Arithru quickly, and I'm the Arithru bondsmith. I need a mini mini oath game where I am to transport me there. But it's probably more complicated than that. Making oath gates. She has just like the MMO return spell at the ready. <laughs> a hearthstone. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of these of these pairings. Maybe it's like. Dalinar's prepping for the duel with Shalon and Navani and maybe Renarin also doing putting some prep work in like con- contingencies for failures, maybe for like failure, putting some contingency plans in place or like not contingency plan, but like if things go wrong. Yeah. What do we need to like start doing? I don't know. Yeah. And like what what do yeah, so like Adolin, like one one option for Adolin that is that he is like hunting Bado Mishram, but he could also like he has made forays into shade smart diplomacy at this point. It's true. Yeah. And like it would let him like hang out with Maya more. Which I I'm always down for more Maya chapters. I guess it's possible that like Bado Mishram is in Shadesmar somewhere in like a cryptic fortress or like where the high spren are or where the ink spren are and so they're like oh we need to send kind of of, but that feels like a repeat of of rhythm of wars like lasting integrity expedition Mm. italy is going deep sea dive and pick up a gem (laughs) through the ocean (laughs) oh no we need we need the thrill oh he's just his chapters are just gonna be learning how to snorkel oh yeah in in a sea of, of beads what else? So Yasna, we don't know what Yasna. I have no idea what Yasna is going to be doing in her chapters. 
if they are like a separate plot thread for from Dalinar and Navani and Trulane. Yeah. Sorry, not Trulane. Trulane will probably be there in Renorin chapters. Oh, certainly, yeah. 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 Venli is with the, the listeners, I think. I don't think there's really yeah. a much question yeah. of that. Yeah. I imagine they will connect back to the main plot in some way at some yeah. point. Uh, but at least at first, we need to figure out what like what's been going on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she seems to be building a little like Will Shaper gang there with her listeners. Yeah, Leshu is there too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, she she is there. It's actually also uh, like to speak both of the structure, but also the a bit about the that last chapter. It's interesting that Brandon has like censored what yes what Sean and Adolin want to talk about, because like, it should be stuff we already know about. Because it oh, should be... St- I oh, think, I think that's just like narrative tension. Mm-hmm. I think that's just like a chapter, like oh. chapter ending kind of on a cliffhanger. You know, I mean, door like, bursts open. I have news! And chapter. Yeah, but like Brandon did like point, specifically point out that he's cutting some stuff up and keep uh, skipping ahead. Yeah, I mean... I think it's just like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not super questioning that. I think it's like he wanted to read something that focused on these particular characters and was okay, kind of, that's fair. yeah, I don't know. That's fair. Maybe, maybe like something happens or like they yeah. find something on, on their way back from last maybe. integrity, right? Maybe, maybe it's there's... not just a, an easy teleport. Uh, well, I think, I think we've run out of things to talk about, which considering that it's only the three of us and we only have a handful of chapters and like nothing happens in the Zeth chapters and nothing happens in the Kaladin chapters either. I'm shocked. We, we broke two hours of recording. I was concerned that we would, uh, we would struggle to reach one hour. Uh, but once again, I have underestimated our power. That, that said... It is, it is time to, to do everyone's favorite game show uh, that is not Ship It or Rip It. It is Who's That Cosmere Character? This character is from Roshar. Menace. Tian Tong. Braze. Void in drag on a horse. <laughs> it's time for Who's That? Cosmere character! Call! Alright, listeners, you know how the game is played. You send an email to WTCC at 17shard.com with five clues in the character that those clues correspond to. I read each clue aloud, and after each one, our panelists have a chance to guess who's that Cosmere character. Let's begin. This first one was sent in by Larry. Clue one, this character has brown eyes. A Kaladin? It is not a Kaladin. Tien. It's not Tien. Blue 2. This character is good at mathematics. Oh. Shy? It's not shy. I forgot his name, but I wanted to guess the Storm Warden who is like with Amaram in the tent when they like brand Kaladin. It's, it's not Amaram Storm Warden. Okay. Blue 3. This character was a guide for a powerful person. Liren. It's not Liren. Oh, is it? Oh, I forgot the name. Felt? It is not Felt. Clue four. This character is a dark sider. Well, that's rude. That's a twist. Um, <laughs> is it uh, Professor... Uh, oh. Not not the linguist one, the other one. Is it is it Cinder or not there's Cinder? There's one the Cinder and there's one that starts with A. Uh John Akron is the other one. Okay. So is it is it John Akron? It is not John Akron. Uh I will guess. Wow, I names are hard. Uh, the little girl who is a guide to Chris when she arrives in Kesare and takes her to like that guy who has a fireplace in his house. Do you know her name? I, I find you her name. I would. Um, 
No. I just know she's like a, a little girl that looks a little bit like Lyft. Oh. Oh, I'll let you know we're sorry. If you know the name, I'll let you steal it. I have no idea. It, wow. It is that rude. person. Rude. I will. Okay. It's, I uh, her don't... name is Intease. In in yeah, and and an apostrophe TC. Yep. Yeah, TC. I would not have guessed that in a thousand years. <laughs> She's good at mathematics? Apparently. <laughs> I don't remember that. And the, the copper mine specifically says that Ntis is not good at mathematics. Does it? Did yep. I misread it or did the person send it wrong? It says like the last line of her like appearance and personality. She is not good at mathematics. Well, I am glad I guess things. Oh, I did misread the... that. It does say not good at mathematics. <laughs> but I don't think that's something any of us I, knew about her. To I completely better. just dropped that clue from my guesses. Yeah, Dark, Dark Sider was a big one, right? All right. This one was sent in by Lilibet. Clue one. This character eats on screen. Well, there is the obvious guess. <laughs> so I'll just get it over with lift. Just not lift. Uh, ba, 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 Galadon. It is not Galadon. Clue two. This character is gentle. Rock? It is not rock. Raiden. And it's not Raiden. Clue three. This character is a fancy. Ellen? It's not Ellen. Um. Uncle Kayain. It is not Uncle Kayain. Clue four. This character is not heterosexual. Uh. This makes it difficult to continue guessing Elantrian characters. <laughs> uh, is it uh, Ranet's, no, Ranet's wife, Jaxi? It is Jaxi. Wow. Who <laughs> five was this character likes the rough? F's in chat for Miss Ra. The ex who was forgotten. And never seen on page. Nope. Mm -hmm. All right, we have we have concluded the Casimir. Who's who's that? Who's that Casimir character? And that has also concluded our episode on the Stormlight Five, which not once in this episode, by the way, did we say the name of the book. <laughs> I just want to point that out. I don't think do any of us like the name that's currently the active name. Is is it just like a protest? Knights of Knights of Wind and Truth. Yeah, I I think it's a protest. It's like it's actually like Knights of Truths and Winds, which I do not like the plural. Oh, it's it's Truth and Wind. But that doesn't no, even. No, no, no. It's it's Wind and Truth because it's it's yeah. Okay, you are right. It's Wind and Truth. So that has to be K O W T. What? Coat. What? You quat, mate. I want to. I want to just briefly. So. You you want you need the T from the the in there, but you're okay with adding an extra A for and. Like I just, <laughs> I think this symmetry thing is just doesn't make sense. Like it's a gimmick. It's a gimmick, but I think it's dumb. I think it's dumb gimmick. Without the end, we could have had nights of windy truths. Windy and truths. <laughs> would that be better? Of of wumpy tompy. Anyway. So, so Night Knights of Wind and Truth is the current tentative title of this book. We'll see if that sticks around. Uh, I'm not getting the impression that that Brandon is is vibing uh, with this as much as he was with like other titles, such as Stones and Hollowed. Rip, rest in pieces. But anyway, so so that's that's the that's the end of the episode. Uh, who are we? We are the Seventeenth Shard. I'm amazed you made it all the way to the end of this long ass episode and and didn't know who we are but if you are new uh to the show welcome this is the kind of stuff that we do we aim for a kind of a balance between informative and unhinged uh with like a seasoning of funny on top you can you can find more of this stuff on our youtube channel and like anywhere podcasts are served 
Uh, you can leave us comments and ratings and reviews and things like that because the the shard of algorithm, uh, which is the final one of the 16th shards, is the most powerful one and we must appease it. We we have a Patreon. Patreon is only a dollar. We also have other series. So like if this weird, so if you managed to last all the way until the, the end of this episode and you were like, mm, I don't know, this is my vibe. Uh, we have a uh, rereads series called span reads where uh, we go through all of the books and we like analyze them uh, and we talk about them. We also have uh, a couple of like actual play shows uh, labeled under the Diceborn umbrella. We have like a full season one and we have like a, a, a one, a 20 hour one shot because we don't know how to do short form content. So you can uh, you can go check those out mm -hmm. and uh, you can visit us on our discord that's been just popping the discord's popping yo <laughs> uh, and you can also visit us uh, on on our website uh, 17shard.com that's it that's it we hope we hope you you had fun and you'll come back for more fun bye 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 see ya <laughs>